He's not in today. Hello. Oh. Okay, so today, thank you all for coming. Um, everyone, I think, knows Matthew Oldham, PhD student, and he stepped in at the last minute to give a talk today on basketball, which has been evolving through a couple of courses from George Mason. Yes, so, uh, well, thank you, Andrew. It's, it's a bit more, it's, I suppose, because I was thrown in uh, at the last minute, there's a bit of padding at the front uh, on sports analytics in general, and then I'll get to a, an agent-based model on basketball at the end. So, uh, and I just say, uh, if you've got a uh, computer or any sort of tablet, you might need it, because I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But, um, so, uh, <coughs> as I said, like this presentation, there's a few digressions along the way before I uh, actually get into the agent-based model uh, and what I actually found. And, uh, you know, the digressions actually help build the case as to why you'd want to uh, actually look at an agent-based model in sports. It's, uh, obviously, people have looked at economies and <coughs> GIS stuff and all sorts of manner of things, but uh, no one's actually done anything with agent-based modelling in sport. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I'll, um, as I said... Well, I've the story, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so just before we start, this, this presentation is actually going to be interactive. So uh, if you all go to uh, <coughs> slido.com uh, and then it's going to ask you for an event code mm -hmm. and I'm just going to activate the first question uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to that to a minute, in a minute. Now, judging by no laughs, uh, this guy was actually at the Super Bowl on Sunday and he was texting while Justin Timberlake was just there. So uh, I assume that most people are just going to be uh, Googling that during this presentation. So, uh, <laughs> any manner of thing. So, um, so sports analytics, uh, you know, really the field started in the 50s. Uh, it actually started you know, mainly with an OR uh, background or interest in, in sports and uh, you know, there was a paper here by Wright and uh, it was seen as a frivolous and a hobby industry but uh, you can see that uh, 2015 the market or the revenue produced by sports analytics was 90 million dollars US by 2020 that's meant to go to 500 million so we've seen Rob discuss about the take up of uh, agent based modelling and game theory uh, but you can actually see like this exponential growth in sports analytics. Uh, so, you know, there's a course here at George Mason uh, taken by Brian Burke who works at ESPN. So it's, you know, it's now in academia, uh, but there's a lot, you know, it, the field has been <coughs> fairly fragmented, but it's improving. Like there's been no overarching theory. It's just been a lot of application of OR theories. Uh, and I'll discuss some physics later on. I'll uh, talk this is a, uh, Brian Burke, who's, uh, he teaches the OR course <coughs> that, uh, I just discussed. Uh, so the question is like, what, what forced this growth of sports analytics? Um, and just before we get that, we'll just... Uh, yeah. Anyway, so what, what changed in terms of the growth of sports analytics? Uh, this is a bit of editorialising, but uh, you know, way back here in the 50s, there was some you know, research done, but the first one was this Bill James uh, Sabermetrics, <coughs> which was uh, a lot of baseball statistics. So it was a nighttime, at a nighttime job, so he started putting the, together these um, all these baseball metrics that some people used and then ultimately in industry the Oakland A's uh, started to use it and became successful. Now the story behind the Oakland A's were that they were you know, a small budget franchise and they basically played above their weight through this period and then that was popularised by Michael Lewis in Moneyball. So the secret got out in Moneyball uh, and then it started to feed upon itself and then the Boston <coughs> Red Sox started to use sports analytics a, bit, a lot more. And then we have fantasy football as well, which has led to this, as I said, explosion in sports analytics. Um, 
Now, this is taken from some of Brian's classes, but um, show it. if we just look at what sports analytics involves, it's like things interesting to teams, things helpful for teams, and things interesting to science. Uh, and so what we're going to look at is sort of, you know, there are these sort of rosters and payroll, which is like an optimization question, uh, how to make in-game decisions <coughs> and other approaches. Um, and when we look at the pyramid or how it uh, works in terms of sports analytics, uh, again, this is one of Brian's charts. That, you know, at the start, it probably worked just due to the lack of data. You know, there was wins and losses and not a lot of player data and also some of the OR approaches. It was sort of a top-down approach the way it evolved. So it was, how do I win? What are the conditions behind winning? Uh, what are the scores and possessions? And then we can start to get into the game. So how many possessions, how do plays unfold, and then intra-level events. Uh, so re really what got, apart from, I suppose, a lot of the statistics going, or well, sports analytics going back to when I followed sport as a kid, <coughs> Uh, when you look at this class or the computational social science thing, we, we start to look at systems from the bottom up. Uh, and we do that because it's more fun, it's more challenging, you get more interesting results, and it's more important. Uh, so, you know, we've seen that with, again, economy, slums, networks. Uh, so why not have a look at that in terms of a sporting event? Uh, and I'll touch on, uh, you know, why you do an agent-based modeling and uh, agent-based model and some of the advantages. But the first digression, uh, this is a bit of padding, is like this year's Nobel Prize winner, Richard Thaler, uh, you know, he's used sports analytics as one of his like uh, sort of tools to help explain how people aren't rational and how people don't, markets don't operate efficiently. <coughs> so. Uh, even when I went to the uh, the CFA conference in uh, Philadelphia last year, one of the you know this is a mar a room full of stockbrokers and financial advisors and wealth managers. He still brought up this study about um, how inefficient the NFL market was in terms of uh, adding putting value on uh, draft picks. So you know, normally I speak about economics and boring topics about you know, networks and investors and why the market drops 10% in February of one data point. Uh, but so I'm going to come back to that. And, uh, and the point is that rational markets or rational expectations and efficient markets are still relevant to sport. So you know, we go to the Chicago school. Uh, you know, rational expectations, everyone has the same belief because everyone has the same information and will form you know, a, a common view of the value of something. Um, so there should be no arbitrage in a market. So there should be no ability for someone to outperform someone else in an efficient market. Uh, so as I said, the market value will equal the expected value and the aggregated expectations are unbiased. So, you know, it's the, the wisdom of the crowd, everyone comes together, so everyone should know how much a player is worth, just like everyone should know how much a stock is worth, how much a can of Coke is worth. Um, and this is the point was that Thaler sort of brought out, uh, well, it's actually Massey and Thaler, and uh, you know, Thaler probably gets more credit because he's got the Nobel Prize now, uh, but the point was an emotion over confidence and winner's curse comes into play. And so I just touch on this slide. Um, so when you're drafting a player into your team, you obviously want to be successful and get value for your money uh, and pick the right player. And so, you know, I, I use this in another presentation, but ultimately <coughs> you want to pick some, you want to be in this box and not this box or that box. Um, and so the question is, how do you, stay away from the far right hand <coughs> column. Uh, and this is a, another paper Massey followed up with about how you do better at the draft. Uh, and part of this is, you know, he says, well, you can get more trade picks and for reasons I won't go into, that's a lot harder now. Be sensible, which is the point of this uh, next slide, 
is that you know, it's very hard to be sensible and this is where the irrational behaviour in, in the market came from. Uh, so this was yeah, the paper, Massey and Thaler. Uh, now the point is really here that if you've got no forecasting ability in the market, so you've got no ability to understand how good a player might be or can be, then every pick is going to be the same value because it's just a random choice. But if you've got a hundred percent foresight, then it's going to drop away very quickly in terms of the value because you're going to under everyone's going to understand who the best player is and you're going to bid the right amount, be prepared to pay the right amount for that person. Uh, now, the whole, you know, the crux of the paper is uh, that you've got a gap between what you pay someone and the performance of the player, and this is the draft pick where you take the player. Now, what this shows is obviously you've got a, a curved line, and if it's the market is efficient, you shouldn't have this curved line because here, in this section, you're overpaying for players because your surplus is lower. So the gap between the performance and the compensation is lower for the higher draft picks. And this was the point of the paper that Thaler made, well, Massey <coughs> Thaler point, is that people get overconfident and biased and think that it's better to have pick one or pick two and they overbid for those picks. So this was using sports analytics to uh, create or to illustrate the point that humans, in what is a pretty specialised field of sports, uh, make poor choices. Now the next thing which is a bit closer to home is sports as a complex system. Uh, a lot of people don't probably think about sports as a complex system the, the <coughs> way we do. I'm just going to touch on uh, a bit of Formula One. Uh, Andrew uh, raised a paper that, or there's a paper about boxing being a complex sport that came out of Oxford, if you want to see that. Uh, and then also scoring patterns. Now there's a, a video I can point you to uh, that comes from Santa Fe Institute about all about the scoring patterns in sport. Uh, but uh, obviously here in complex systems we're all used to scaling, power laws. Um, you know, the first use of sports analytics in terms of um, scaling actually came back in the 1956. Now, apparently Galileo made a prediction about how strength should scale with your weight. So everyone goes, oh, the ant's the strongest. You know, an ant can lift so much compared to its weight. Um, and then obviously all mammals and reptiles and creatures scaled at that same rate, we'd be able to lift a lot more than what we can. Um, but however, Galileo made a prediction about there's a uh, decreasing returns to scale as the the more you weigh, the less you can relatively lift. So uh, this guy in 1956, now this isn't his actual chart, there's a chart in Science magazine from 1956, showed here, this is meant to be in log scale, but your body weight category and the maximum amount that you can lift. And that fits the two thirds body weight rule. So, you know, you don't, as your body weight goes up, you don't. It's not a one-for-one one relationship about what you can lift. It's a two-thirds <coughs> relationship. So, uh, even though you're a big guy, you know, these guys are relatively. Or this is for men and the women. Uh, that there's a relatively better. Uh, lighter people are relatively uh, lift a relatively higher amount of weight. <coughs> so I just thought that was interesting when I came across it. That sports analytics goes back has a relationship with complex systems and complexity back to the, to the 1950s. Uh, and this is like a, a bit of a project I did uh, in terms of Formula One for the Power mm. Laws class, which sort of gives it away, but uh, this is sort of all Ferraris uh, over time. Well, starting back from a vintage Ferrari, it's probably a Bugatti, but it just shows the but if we look at Formula One, which is seen as like the premier motorsport in the world, uh, you know, it's hard. Uh, is, this is about 2015 data, so 
500, uh, so 893 races have been held. Uh, there's been 137 teams compete. There's only nine teams that compete at the moment. Uh, only 31 teams have ever won a race. Uh, but the interesting thing about Formula One or motor racing is that success is a relative thing. You just need to be quicker than the next person. Just like, how do you avoid being <coughs> eaten by a bear? Just be quicker than you know the person behind you. So, uh, so it's not about outright speed. So the question is, how do you compete in uh, in this sort of environment? So um, I said, like in terms of success, it's hard to come by. Twenty-two teams have won a, a race. So if I look at all the race results, uh, which I got all the data in terms of uh, every team that's competed since 1956. Uh, this is the podiums. So this is like the zip law distribution, which shows, you now this is for um, Ferrari up here in terms of podiums. I think that was McLaren. You know, a lot of teams have never even got on the podium. Uh, and then we can see that you know, it's not a perfect power law distribution, but it scales very well, indicating that there's a, probably a complex system type environment involved in, uh, in Formula One or in terms of the determinants of success of Formula One. Uh, in terms of fastest laps, again, it's a, a very skewed distribution, which proves that uh, some people have been successful. Uh, and, you know, I did that for wins pole positions, uh, a few other things. So, and the similar thing, a very skewed distribution. <coughs> but that's sort of pointless. Uh, just pointing that out, you've got to understand why that might be the case. And the mechanism uh, that I came across is path dependency and increasing returns to scale, which conveniently comes from Brian Arthur at a Santa Fe in the complexity world. Uh, and the, the Big thing is that Formula One is in constant <coughs> state of change. There's always new regulations, testing, teams are updating. So it's all about being successful all the time. And it's, all, and it's also about having the right combination of resources, financial, human resources, and intellectual capital. And um, you, know, you look at the data, and it's not here, it's in the paper that, uh, it's on, that mm -hmm. I presented, in the class is that like budget helps but it's no guarantee of success there's been teams which have had very high budgets have been a complete failure uh, there's been people that had resources such as drivers and engineers that have been successful with other teams and have come to new teams and not been successful uh, and so the point was and i used it in a, a crude agent based model was that you, know, you can sit here in terms of a team and then you can fall either way, but with increasing returns to scale and path dependency, uh, you know, your probability of getting the right res uh, resource to win is, is, goes like this. And I was able to present sort of the um, crudely uh, success power laws. <coughs> it was an early attempt and very crude. Um, now in terms of scoring patterns, th this is really what comes into play in my model uh, now there's a whole host of papers on this and it's really that scoring patterns this is for basketball the NBA basketball so it's I think 8,000 or 9,000 games they analyze this is the amount of seconds so basically apart from the start of the quarter and the end of the quarter scoring is just a random walk in the process in, in the outcome so now if you, if you got a like, I think a New York Knicks are the most valuable NBA franchise. At, you know, fifty odd, I mean, five billion or whatever it was. Like, you're not going to be very happy when someone tells you the success of your team is just based on a random walk. You know, like it's just you know a random walk, which you know digress, digressing is just basically comes about that. The analogy is if you're a drunk person leaving the bar one night. What are your chances of getting home? Like you eventually get there, but what path you take, you know, you might go left of the street, right of the street, but eventually you'll get there, uh, but no one really knows that pattern of how you're gonna get there. Now, why, you know, the excuses as to why it is a random walk, oh, and I should point, 
out also that the scoring in these last periods, uh, if you look at the scoring events, it becomes, uh, again, a power law-like distribution in terms of the time intervals between each scoring event. Uh, it gets very condensed in the last, especially the last two minutes of the quarter, or the two minutes of the game, which is not unexpected given that's when you're trying to win the game. Um, but they say, why, why would this be the case? Now they're saying, well, skill counts cancels each other out. So obviously, if we got five people here and play the Golden State, well, scoring's not going to be in a random walk. It's going to be very lopsided. But if you've got two fairly evenly matched teams, then uh, the skill cancels out each other and you just get the random walk. Uh, also, people are just short term in their views, so they just want to maximise the score. So, you know, there's an analogy there to the, you know, even financial markets that if you've just got a short term view, you're just going to do the next two seconds what's best to meet that goal of like make money. So, you're not going to think about the, the longer picture. So, there's not necessarily a lot of strategy at play. Uh, each game is different. Um, and what they also did. Uh, is in this paper that they tried to work out uh, how safe is your league. So they, they did this for uh, the NBA, the hockey, the football, and another sport as well. Uh, and Brian's also done a lot of this work uh, in the NFL. Uh, but they've taken here, you know, they produce this <coughs> physics equation, which I'm not really quite sure how to interpret, but basically it means that if you've got a 10 point lead is safe when there's 7.87 minutes left in the game. And this is, um, I, I mentioned Bill James, so he had an heuristic about the effective lead and the probability of losing that. Uh, you can see it's a very different equation. Uh, yeah, so this is the NBA games and that's their equation. So. Um, now, when I read these papers, it really got me thinking about, um, you know, well, they've done this with physics and math. Could you do it with an agent-based model? And what would I need to actually aim at when I create that model in terms of validation? Um, you know, now it's time for the next question, uh, if everyone's got their stuff. Uh, that question. Uh, so obviously not everyone has it, but uh, this is like a f another behavioural aspect which comes from sports analytics, which also uh, moves into uh, you know, other realms, but it also touches on uh, the work of Danny Kamen and, and, uh, and you know, the guys which ultimately created behavioural economics. Uh, so this team here is the... Uh, the Philadelphia 76ers from about the 1980s and it's the reason I've got it up there is because there was a study done uh, in terms of um, uh, the streaks that these players had now those who haven't got their technology up the qu question I asked was does a player have a better chance of making a shot after having just made his last two or three shots than he does after having just missed his last two or three shots. Now, a lot of people in the answers, and I think it's as high as 93%, will say, oh, I've got a better, that person's got a better chance of making it if they've made the last two or three than if they've just missed the <coughs> last two or three. Now, this sort of comes into the hot hand uh, and streaks and the law of small numbers. So the, the implication for behavioral economics was that people just like take a small sample, like i.e. the last three shots, and that's how they base their expectations going forward. So in, in this paper, they looked at all this uh, data from the 76ers, the Celtics, and a controlled experiment uh, and basically, while everyone thought people were going to be more successful if they just shot their last two or three, there's absolutely, uh, well, let's say, there's no support in their findings for it, uh, but players and players and fans still believe in it. So if you sit there and watch any professional sport, 
they'll go, oh, he's hot, he's hot, he's on a streak. <clears throat> but there's absolutely no evidence statistically that people are on that. Uh, and another thing is, uh, you know, uh, learned in Brian's class, people, commentators would talk about the momentum changing in games. Now we go back to the random walk, if a sport is actually a random walk, there's no such thing really as momentum in the play. So it's another fallacy which is sort of in everyone's psyche when they watch sport. Uh, and you know, even you hear players, uh, I was listening to <coughs> Jason Day the other day, he goes, oh, the momentum shifted in my round. Now, it's just something that's in people's head that doesn't uh, really exist. Anyway, it opened a can of worms and there's a great paper that goes into 20 years of research on the hot hand. Now it goes into golf, basketball, darts, 10 pin bowling, I think there's even like croquet. People just like, <laughs> every any sports field, they've like all looked at it. And uh, this is the, you know, if I'm being overly optimistic, the evidence is mixed at best. So uh, anyway, having said that, uh, it will play a part in my agent-based model. Uh, anyway, so you know, here's what is a streak, any unbroken series, so head, 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 tails, uh, and you use this statistical test, the runs test, to see you know, was it random or was it truly a streak. So, um, and, and just to give you an example, like you know, that's obviously not a streak, uh, that's not a streak, you know, like there's three tails in a row. So if you had a few scotches and you, no, oh, you guys don't play too up here. It's a game in Australia where you toss coins, but sure, yeah, you know, a lot of people would go, oh, I'm going to have to like go tails again or I'm due for heads. Uh, and there's like a really interesting result uh, in my model about uh, streaks, which is like a, quite an outlier, but interesting. But uh, and the point is, did a player perform above or below for an extended period of time? Uh, now in another class, uh, I sort of like golf's a bit of a pastime. Uh, in terms of like random bl uh, black swan events, that's my only hole in one in golf. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm very proud of that. Apart from the daggy fisherman hat that my kids raise. Uh, but did anyone watch you get that for the I did. They did. It was in a tournament, actually. Really? So uh, fortunately, I didn't have to shout the bar because it was a day where it was like free beer. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so stats five one five. I took the opportunity. Uh, you know, it's not the greatest course at the university, but I took the opportunity uh, to use it to investigate golf and hot streaks. Um, now. I, the background of this is like there's already a lot of work done on whether golfers get streaky. Uh, and the initial work, if we go back to that pyramid, was like um, subpar rounds. So golfers that got under par, did they get it in like streaks? And then that's like a whole round. And then people looked at other um, shorter intervals about whether people got streaky for golf. Uh, now, this is like a great paper on the performance metrics of golf. If you're interested, but uh, you know, there's an old adage, drive for show and putt for dough, which is like the idea you might be able to hit the ball a long way, but if you can't putt it, it doesn't matter. Now, uh, it was interesting, like last year, an Australian golfer, Mark Leishman, won an event and they go, oh, you, you're driving well. And he goes, yes, well, golf's a lot easier if you get the ball in the fairway. So I was just trying to understand, you know, like, you know, how important is driving, whether it's underplayed. So, um, and especially with this paper from Mark Brody, who sort of revolutionised, I, I think that's fair, revolutionised golf analytics. Uh, you know, the point of it is like the long, everyone goes putt for dough, but in terms of where you, this is from PGA data over 10 years, uh, where the biggest variation between this was like Tiger Woods in the rest of the field was like, it was in the long game. So long shots, like Tiger Woods was significantly superior to any other golfer in the long game. Uh, so, you know, he, this is Jordan Spieth when he won the Masters, <coughs> but this is the sort of shot Tiger Woods 
regularly hit. So um, now, how Mark uh, Brody did this was he had this metric called shots gained, uh, and I just have to explain this. So what he did. So if you got two golfers, the tour average is four point two shots to get the ball from there into the hole. So down here. Now, if say this person hits it here, it's now uh, 3.4 shots from this point into the hole. So 4.2 minus 3.4 minus 1 is negative 0.2. So he's effectively lost 0.2 of a shot due to that shot. <coughs> now this guy has hit it down here, so the tour average from here is 2.8. And so he's got 4.2 <coughs> minus 2.8 minus 1. So he's gained 0.4 of a shot. So what I did in this, and the analysis was, well, let's get all the driving performance of all the PGA players over three years and under see whether A, golfers get streaky off the tee, and also, which I don't discuss here, is whether that helped explain where you finished in an event. So I you know, use the machine learning to try and understand driving performance and where you finish. Uh, so what I found was like, uh, it was skewed data. Uh, so here's the strokes gained in terms of all the players. So you know, there's most people, you know, because it's an average, there is a skew that some people are always going to be better than average. Uh, but the once I adjusted, um, well, I had to adjust. If you're a very good driver for the streak, I had to say, well, if, you're av if your average gain off the tee is 0.5 of a shot, your streak needs to be 0.5 or above. So you're above your, because we're going back to the expect, what a streak is, is whether you perform above your expectation. Um, but what, one thing I found was that the players with a higher stroke, this is standard deviation, and this is strokes, uh, gain so the players which are generally gaining strokes off the tee have a lower variance so they're always performing a little better so when you plot three years of tournaments um, for each player so now where there's a break where there's white space is where there's like uh, a break or what could be determined as a um, you know, it just changes. So here this player has a hot streak here. So it identifies it here because you can see all the, yeah, the, the red dot is when it's below the player's average, the black dot's above. So here there's a whole group of black circles above. So this is a streak. But this player, even though you might think, oh, that might be a streak, that might be a streak, this player didn't have a streak. So off the tee. So anyway, uh, what I found is roughly about 6% six, six of players across these three seasons do get on a streak <coughs> off the tee in terms of performing above their expected, um, yeah, above their expectations. So that was sort of the entree. Uh, now we're going to get to the, the, the guts of uh, the presentation, <coughs> which is uh, the MBA via an agent-based model. If anyone who sort of knows NetLogo, uh, it's sort of like the uh, introductory way to model um, agent-based models, but it's one of its advantages, it's very good for visualization and it allows relatively <coughs> easy 3D space or to model in a 3D space. So Andrew's always been, uh, well, I suppose going back to my Battle of Britain model, Andrew always pushed to use the graphics uh, and the availability to enhance the model. Uh, so here we have the, the model in, um, in 3D, which I'll show in a, in a minute. But uh, you know, the question is, why would I want to do this? I, it's like, it's not like, I actually did this outside of a class. It was all part of my uh, scholarship. I had some time to do some free research. So I took the opportunity to do it but, uh, you know, it's, and I'll come back to this as well, but so Burns presented a paper 
uh, where he used a Markov model where players were influenced <coughs> by the hot hand and also a franchise bias. So if you were a, the franchise player, were you more likely to take the shot? Uh, and I think, and also, uh, and then how large your streak was. Now that was just between two players. So it was just like, and it's a, you know, a Markov model. So, you know, you put your formulas in and you'll get a curve. So it doesn't actually <coughs> go into um, a great deal, but it at least opens the way to suggest that you can sim simulate a game computationally. Um, and then there's obviously this uh, Rettner's computational model using those physical formulas. But, uh, you know, if we look at an agent-based model, um, yeah, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, and the first is like, obviously, the temporal aspect. You know, basketball is effectively broken into, broken up into 24 second slots, which is the shot clock. So, you know, the team has got to make a decision, or it's got to like execute a shot within that 24 seconds. So that is a component of how the play um, comes out. So, uh, with an agent-based model, like the agents can <coughs> just work that out. Uh, temporally as well, you know, there is a basketball court. It has a spatial aspect to it. Uh, so again, agent-based model is ideal for that. Uh, and one of the interesting things as well is that, you know, Rob here, he'll try and do an agent-based model of 120 million firms. Andrew's New York model, they're trying to, what, 5 million people? 25. 25 million people, they're trying to like, do that for every agent. Basketball has ten agents, so I don't run into these like massive problems. Uh, the other thing is as well that the data is so there's so much data available now which can help you inform your model. So this is like uh, you know this this comes from a website which is this is from an R script. So. Every shot Stephen Curry's taken is recorded somewhere and you can just like get that through like scraping the web and running this script. You can produce this thing which tells you Stephen Curry shoots 52% of shots from, you know, this is what he, his success rate from here, 63% success from here, 42% from here. So you have this huge amount of data available to help <coughs> calibrate your model. And therefore, if I can get a model even remotely close, I can recreate games and then test theories about what might influence the outcome of a game. Because, you know, as we know with agent-based modeling, it's all about running experiments <coughs> in a computer. So you can't run an experiment about, going, oh, I'm just going to start with really big, slow team, and I'm going to have a season with like that. You know, that could ruin your franchise. Whereas here, an agent-based model, you could build all that in, uh, in into your model and try and understand how it comes out. Uh, so in terms of a quick overview of uh, the game or how the model works, so I split the basketball court up into these various areas. Uh, it should be 70%. Um, and so if a player takes a shot from here, he has 2% chance of getting it in. If he takes a three-point shot, <coughs> he gets a 33% chance of getting it in. If he takes a shot from mid-range, it's 43. And then if he takes it in the key, it's a 50%. So that's his probability of getting the ball in. And then on top of that, each player, uh, depending on your position, so if you're like the center, you can only move around in this area if you're the guard, you move randomly around in that area, uh, and then the, the forwards can move uh, across that way. And I should, um, you know, again, for my model, they're only moving randomly, but in the real world, uh, there's now all the tracking data in terms of where people move in the basketball court. There's even a paper on how people move. Um, so I have. Uh, players have a range of movement, so they can move in here. Here, the red team is playing defense, uh, which is really not a lot of... It, defense isn't a large part of the model. Then offense, they move, and then they have a, 
um, uh, each step in the model is half a second. So I simulate the whole game on half second slots. Uh, all aspects of the NBA game is, are in the model apart from fouls. So the team has to take a shot within 24 seconds. There's passing, there's turnovers, there's steals, there's intercepts, uh, there's offensive <coughs> rebounds, defensive rebounds. Uh, and just how the model uh, plays out is that uh, it starts with, it's basically controlled by this uh, strategy procedure. So it goes, is the ball stolen? Uh, yes, then the turnover procedure happens, so the team swaps. Then uh, it's a shot clock under two seconds. Yes, then the player will shoot. Did it go in? Yes, update the score, then there's an inbound procedure, so the player <coughs> spread, and then it loops round. Uh, did it go in? No, then there's a rebound. Was it an offensive or a defensive rebound? Uh, so then it will like turn over the play or you'll get another shot. Uh, and then so now the shot clock <coughs> under two, no, but it's a shot um, shot flag true, uh, yes, and I'll touch on that in a, in a minute. And then the, no, then you just play offense, which is just move around. Uh, do you pass or shoot? Uh, then you shoot. Uh, so, yeah, you can see that there's whole aspects of like, you know, there's passing, interceptions, turnovers, uh, and, and I'll touch on that in a minute. So this is like the role of the agent. Uh, so again, the uh, you know, 1980s <coughs> graphics. Um, but when a player decides to shoot or not, uh, it's all based on the probability of, sh there's a, uh, a bit of a secret source probability uh, formula that I put in here. So you've got time left, so 24 seconds, uh, and then two seconds left. And the probability of the player shooting uh, will, will increase with time, but it will also increase based on the belief in the hot hand and the strength and the size of the hot hand. So, uh, and that will just move this curve upwards. And so what that means is that if I think uh, my teammate, well, if I've got the last three shots in and I you know, my model, my agent thinks that a streak is three, then I think I'm really confident I'm gonna get the next one. So that boosts the probability. Also, if, you, if you're the franchise player, so if you're LeBron or Russell Westbrook or James Harden, then I'm gonna be more confident I'm gonna take the shot. So again, that will push the curve upwards. And then in terms of pass, if you decide not to shoot, <coughs> then you decide to pass, uh, if not you dribble, but if you decide to pass, you're gonna look, now this is a bit of like code for NetLogo, but basically I'm gonna look within six uh, patches and it's all calibrated at the size of a basketball court and then a 310 degree view. So I <coughs> get everyone who's in that area and then I establish their attractiveness to pass to based on their field goal percentage, the amount of percentage that they've scored for the team, their streak in the hot hand factor, and the franchise player. So that's just like a, a scale. So the higher you are, the more points you get on this, the more likely I am to pass the ball to you. And what this enables is uh, I can collect all the stats of an NBA basketball game. So here uh, I have the number of offensive rebounds, the number of defensive rebounds. Uh, it's the shot clock. I got the score, scoring events, shots made, turnovers, steals. Uh, and here's like the scoring. So this is the cumulative score. Now the point is that like this is just a random walk, right? So let's it's a deterministic model and it's just a random walk in terms of scoring. So you can see the lead difference. It just goes everywhere. Uh, 
scoring events, and then each player's field goal percentage as well. So you can see this player got this shot, or he might have got two shots in a row, and then he drops away. And then everyone sort of goes back to the, the mean in terms of the field goal percentage. Um, so you think, oh, wow, that's... You know, uh, you know, I suppose if it's a random walk, the bar's not that high, so really how great is it? Uh, but I, hopefully I'll convince you that it's I've achieved something of note a bit later on. But uh, if now I'm just going to show you the um, a game uh, here, so we can watch a game in two minutes. And so you can see the players move round; they only can move round in certain areas. Then there's a, a shot's gone in. They play round, uh, and they're moving. Round. So sometimes there's a quick shot that was like a rebound, attempted rebound, and I've speeded up. Uh, you know, if only Brent was here, he could narrate this. Um, with his, <laughs> and I just slow it down here just to show you that some of the stuff that goes on. So you can see the player who's got possession of the ball is the grey, uh, and then he has the ball. <coughs> and you know when the team's playing defense there's no actual real defense in the matter but uh, if I just speed it up here and then you can see the game starts to the stats will um, over time the stats will sort to uh, update So here you can see like the score, you know, the whole game evolves. So uh, now the whole I go well, you know, that was a bit of fun and look, I can do a basketball game. So one or two glitches in it, but uh, <coughs> if, if we go back to the foundations of agent-based modelling, you know, what, one of the keys is to validate your model against real-world data. Um, you know, it's sort of the holy grail of uh, agent-based modelling. And so what I did, you know, touching on the amount, rich amount of data available, uh, even though I went back to 1952 in terms of uh, every NBA game ever played, you can get the results. I just got, took 17 years of data. So 2000 to 2017, mm -hmm. and so I can get all the scores and all the statistics uh, and then validate my model. So what I found was like, here is the scoring density of the NBA over that period. Uh, and then this is the red is my model. Uh, so yeah, it looks like I don't have enough points scored in my game versus reality, but you know, I probably don't have enough three point shots go up. There's no fouls and there's no free throws. There's also no substitutions in this model. so. Uh, you know, there's a small issue there. Uh, there's obviously probably some programming issues there. Uh, and the game's changing. Like if you go back and look at defense, you know, the scores over that 17 years period, they're probably changing. Uh, um, and so this is field goal attempts. Uh, so my distributions, you know, so having more shots, but a bit, bit narrower. Uh, again, there's not a lot of strategy. I'm always going to shoot before the 24 seconds <coughs> with no fouls. The shot clock doesn't reset, so that's you know uh, that's a problem. Uh, and there's also no milking the clock really in terms of like close to the game. Uh, so, you know, I, I miss out a little bit on that. Uh, in terms of like this is one of the more impressive results, which probably thinking about it, it's not that impressive given like I'm using real world statistics in my model uh, to validate the uh, the shooting percentages so if this is like the field goal percentages so this is the amount of field goals which go in this is the MBA <coughs> and this is my model so you know they're you know, 
I'm sure a statistical test will tell you that the means are different, but uh, you, know, you know they're fairly close or closer than what I would have like thought uh, in terms of um, yeah. And also, you know, I could probably widen that out because at the moment all the players have the same shooting percentage from those spots. So I didn't, you know, I had to get the mo a baseline model in, but obviously if you're you know, LeBron versus Jason Smith, there's going to be a natural variation in your ability to make those shots from that, those spots. So, you know, again, I can go into the real world data and say, well, what are the shooting percentages for the, the players in the, you know, the top ranked players versus the not so top ranked players. And then also in this model, most of the shots are taken by the <coughs> franchise player. And also, the defense is, you know, is sort of like all star defense. It's like, moving around, not actually doing much. And the, you know, the, the pressure of the moment is also missing. Like There's no clutch shots. Uh, rebounds, fairly similar, but that's almost a, a replication of the, the, the amount of shots being made. But uh, like when I produced this next chart, I really didn't believe it. Uh, but then in retrospect, going back to the retina paper, if basketball is just a random walk then if you have like a deterministic model like mine <coughs> the margins are going to be fairly similar so here this is the you know all 17 years of NBA data I did 6,700 games for mine and this is the margin so you can see like it's a pretty close fit in terms of the margins uh, you know, and I've got, uh, I have no tapering, so obviously if a team is well up, you're going to rest your all-stars or your better players, so that's going to push it this way. Uh, there's no, none of that sort of like skimming points at the end, but yeah, I thought that was, you know, pretty impressive in terms of a close fit to actual real-world data out of a, a fairly simplistic <coughs> model. Uh, in terms of the experiments, so we had uh, the bias to the franchise player. So if you believe in your franchise player more, uh, that's going to increase the probability of your shooting. If you believe in the hot hand and you reach the player reaches the, <coughs> the hot hand target, you're going to they're going to shoot more. So what I found was like if you've got no belief, this is the games, the score of the games. And so as you believe in your franchise player it just pushes the distribution over. So you believe in your player more, it moves it over, which is like, again, a bit of a, a common sense or a you know, fairly evident thing that if you've got a franchise player, but I guess it's an important implication. Now, the other one here is, this is the interaction of the hot hand effect. And so this is the belief, the hot belief in the hot hand going here, and then the bias. So generally what you see is that when there's a little bit of belief in the hot hand, it will boost the scoring over this, but over time it will it, it will drop back down once it gets too strong. So there's a, if there's a little bit of belief, it's, it's beneficial. Uh, in terms of like trying to ascertain uh, the size, the effect of the size of the streak, the, and the belief in the streak and the belief in the franchise player, uh, I produced these charts. So the red is the highest, which is sort of telling you if you've got a small uh, streak threshold, so just two is, you consider two a streak and a relatively <coughs> modest belief in the hot hand, like 0.33 or 0.66, and then a high belief in the franchise player that is what's going to produce your best result. And we see here, the high belief in the franchise player will always give you the highest score. Um, so I put that uh, down to the yeah, higher consideration means greater confidence. So if you believe you've got the franchise player, uh, I call this the Iverson effect, which is Alan Iverson, uh, who played for about 800 clubs and he's broke, but uh, he took a lot of shots and scored a lot of points. Or it could even be the Kobe effect, you know, one of those players. Um, so the hot hand effect has some effect, but only when the threshold is low. <coughs> uh, 
Um, now, the point is, does size matter in terms of your, uh, the length of the streak that you consider to be important? Now, this is the first thing here, which is, uh, this is, so the model captures the maximum streak in every game. So the average is pretty consistent around six is the average streak. That, and so how I measure that is that like, you know, if, you, if I get one in, and that's for each player. So I get one in, this hot streak metric goes plus one. If I miss it, it goes back to zero. So you can see <coughs> that for the best players, generally six is the average streak in a purely like deterministic <coughs> model. Interestingly here, the outlier, one player shot 20 baskets in a row. Uh, and, you know, if that ever happened in a real world event, you could just imagine what everyone's going to say. But the point, I guess, the outcome of the model and the implication is like it can happen purely by chance that someone does that. So out of 6,700 games, someone gets 20 shots in a row. So, uh, but the other point is here, so this is the. Um, the size of the streak, so two, three, four, five, uh, and it's like no consideration, mild consideration, 0 0.6 and a high consideration. So what you generally see is that um, as the size of the streak goes up and then the consideration of the streak goes up, the scoring goes down because you don't ever get that com sufficient confidence that someone is on a streak. So the best outcome actually is where a streak size is two uh, and then you give only mild consideration to it. So you know, as we can see here, it's going to be quite regularly someone going to get two baskets in a row. But I think the point is that it's really not going to um, be the hot hand you know, even if you believe in it, it's it's not as important as believing in your franchise player. And which doesn't come into this model, it's belief in your franchise player and your franchise player's ability to deliver. So in terms of the uh, the next frontier, I thought Bill would have been here. They would have got the Star Trek joke, but uh, so you know, I can add greater. Uh, uh, heterogeneity into the agents and also more attributes but you know you don't want to throw too much at it because then it's just a mess you know I can use this to optimize a roster in terms of like when I introduce that you know the different players do I want maybe I can change the probability of getting a rebound if I have a taller team probability of getting the basket with other players so you can play around with the mix of your team uh, obviously the speed of the players uh, the player movement, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's this paper that discusses the movement of players as well. Um, so, you know, that, that can be built in, like the players just aren't going to move randomly. You know, you could even set up plays on here. Uh, defense doesn't exist. Um, and just on that, like I was going to put this into the model. Um, which again, the idea came from Brian's class on terms of game theory, that if I'm about to take a shot and I go for a drive that way and my defender goes the same way, then I'm going to have a lower probability of getting that shot. As if I go that way and my defender goes that way, then I'm going to, that's going to increase the probability. So there are all different ways you can change that behavior instead of just looking at the spot going, oh, I've got a 45% chance of getting it from here. You could add that, but uh, you know, I suppose you've got to keep it simple. Otherwise, you just uh, introduce like too much. Uh, you know, you never be able to like knuckle down what are the underlying effects of the model or what are the true effects. And then the fouls would be very hard to do. So, um, so with that, uh, if there's any questions, and then if you go to my website, uh, there's a whole section on sports in there, uh, which has the um, a lot of those papers that I sort of mentioned. So let me just, and that's it. So let me just. Uh,
So if I look at the poles, anyway, that's uh, anyway, so no questions. Is that interesting? Not bad. No, I'm, wa I'm, I'm waiting for the, um, the well, polls I don't to come up to find out oh, what your favourite spot know was. <coughs> I can't believe. By the way, who is that guy? Uh, I don't know. 